So first of all, can, can you please uh, provide some context about the uh, experience you bring uh, to the area of quantum? Uh, introduction to yourselves, to the work that your organizations are doing with quantum. Um, Mohammed, would you like to start? Yes, thanks, Sam. And uh, I'm very happy here to be here in this nice uh, summit. My name is Mohammed Sayari. I'm from uh, Saudi Aramco, which is a global company and a leader, producer of energy and chemical. Um, I've been, um, I'm leading the quantum computing program. Uh, I have a master's degree in uh, quantum computing, more than 20 years of experience in, in uh, technology fields. Uh, we, are, we have started the journey of quantum computing uh, two years back, mainly to, to leverage this technology and uh, have the competitive advantage uh, and see the, the uh, potential areas that this promising technology would give us. Thanks, Sam. And Stuart. And my name's Stuart Robertson. I'm a partner at LEK Consulting, a global strategy consulting firm of about 2,000 professionals around the world. Um, and one of my job titles is Disruptive Analytics Lead, which means I have responsibility for helping LEK itself, but also primarily our clients, navigate disruptive trends in analysis. Uh, that originally started um, eight, nine years ago with our focus on uh, ML and AI. But for the last three or four years, we've been increasingly uh, both fielding questions from our clients and, um, uh, and doing further research on quantum computing and its effect. And I think I'd, I'd characterize the questions we're asked as maybe twofold. One is, um, what should we do about quantum? <laughs> and the second is a question of how do we best invest to be exposed to the benefits quantum computing might bring, and uh, so from particularly capital providers, private equity groups, and so forth, uh, interested to know where in the value chain or within their own portfolio companies they should put capital to uh, best take advantage of the uh, opportunity quantum computing provides. Great, thank you. So, Mohammed, let's start off talking about you know why adopters might start to explore uh, quantum technology. Why has Saudi Aramco started this process to explore and deploy quantum computing? Yes. Yeah. In fact, when it comes to uh, Saudi Aramco, it's uh, it's proactive and adopting and uh, integrating the uh, latest technologies into its uh, operation uh, in order to, to benefit uh, its customers. Uh, and in quantum computing, we, we had to see the, uh, that uh, it's similar to the other uh, emerging technologies. We, we had to step into it and, and see the potential and promising areas of, of that field. That, that's the, the main driver behind us tapping into the quantum computing. Thank okay. You. And Stuart, what factors do you help clients consider um, in evaluating whether to address quantum computing, you know, whether that, that question is, is an urgent challenge for the client or not? Yeah, I, th I think that's, <laughs> that is in some ways the core of every question we address. And uh, one of the ways we've tried to think about it is by characterizing organizations as to whether they are uh, pioneers in quantum computing, mm -hmm. early adopters, mature adopters, or bystanders, so to speak. And it's relatively easy to know if you are a pioneer or a bystander. You'll be a bystander if there's limited analytical application in your business today, and quantum computing is unlikely to change that. Likewise, if you're already pioneering technologies or deep within uh, development of quantum computing, then you will probably be aware of that. So the subtlety comes between distinguishing for those businesses where there is a significant analytical um, element to it, should you be an early adopter or a late adopter? And um, I think, Sam, in fact, your uh, introductory keynote, uh, which for those who missed is well worth uh, checking out later if, it's, uh, if you have the opportunity, um, summarized it perfectly for the early adopters, which is if your business has at its heart a core requirement for a um, significant analytical process in simulation, uh, optimization uh, in particular, then you are likely to want to be an early adopter. 
And at the moment, certainly based on the experience with uh, people we speak with, you're unlikely to see a advantage from that tomorrow. I don't know, Mohammed can <laughs> probably uh, confirm as a practitioner um, directly that that's the case. But being able to invest, invest ahead of time to build that understanding such that when opportunities do arise, for those businesses, it, that will be a considerable competitive advantage. If you're not in that camp, uh, we genuinely advise, don't worry about it quite yet. There's enough uncertainty in the technology stack and the best practices that if, if this isn't going to be a core area of competitive advantage for you, you're better off watching what people like Mohammed are doing, <laughs> uh, learning from that. And when the technology becomes more mature and more capable of sustaining your processes, that's the moment you switch. Um, and you, otherwise, you'll be investing where you don't have um, an obvious advantage from, um, from being a first mover. OK. And uh, Mohammed, how would you characterize the stage, if you will, mm -hmm. the stage of quantum computing adoption at Saudi Aramco? What, what, what's your near-term focus? I see. Um, in fact, we, uh, we, uh, we have parallel like, focus areas on, on that regard. Um, as Tua said, we, we are as early adopters. We, uh, we care about uh, upskilling our people. We would like to increase the awareness of the quantum computing uh, in, in our uh, company. Uh, additionally, to, to see the, the potential areas, the proof of concepts, use cases, uh, see the quantum advantage on these ones. So we, we work on in parallel activities on, on that regard. The, these are the, our current focus areas, yes. Okay. And Stuart, very similar question. How would you characterize the stage of quantum computing adoption of your clients? Um, I'll, I'll leave it there. How do, how do, are they all still experimenting, essentially? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that would be fair. I think our, our, our clients and people who approach us with these questions can be maybe split into three. There are those who are participating in the value chain of quantum computing, yes. so they're maybe providing software or refrigeration or other cryogenic techniques mm. or so forth. Uh, they have a different set of questions about the future of the technology to some extent because they're relying on its growth to fund their business activities. For those trying to use quantum computing to improve their technologies, I think experimenting would be best. Or indeed, I'd almost say in the majority of instances, thinking about whether they should be experimenting. <laughs> um, and I think that's right where we are in this process. There's, um, there's a lot of excitement. I'm a huge believer in the potential for this technology. Again. Sam, earlier you touched on the fact that many, the potential of this technology is in some ways unproven, and there are a minority mm. but important dissenting voices as to what that opportunity may be like. I'm not one of those dissenters, but I'm also realistic that um, the technology is not, as of today, delivering um, the promise that it has in the future. So. Uh, yeah, I think everyone is experimenting at this point in time based on, based on what I've experienced. Uh, Stuart, I'll, I'll stick with you for a second. Um, so uh, Mr. Mahajan from Fujitsu was talking about the uh, simulation work that yeah. uh, Fujitsu is doing. Um, how can adopters best use simulation of quantum computing to practice and prepare mm -hmm. themselves for quantum computing? I think we're big believers that simulation is the best first step for the majority of organizations uh, getting started on a quantum computing journey. The hardware is, the availability of hardware is limited, and that which is available tends to be annealing, which is very important for optimization, and there's a lot of benefit there. But most organizations don't want to put that level of uh, investment into hardware at this stage, that, that may vary. Uh, and indeed, Mohammed's organization is one uh, who uh, could choose to do so if it so wished, um, more simply than others. For those earlier in that journey, experimentation through simulation, I think, has a number of benefits. It's cheaper, it's more readily available, and realistically, in the development of uh, skills, and I saw the uh, handout on the table from the um, research that uh, 
Omdia were just doing uh, earlier this year, uh, saying how upskilling people was one of the biggest challenges. And at the moment, what we observe is a lot of organizations are effectively taking people to some extent with a similar background like myself in more ML and artificial intelligence and trying to move them over to quantum computing expertise uh, more than they're able to hire uh, people who qualified through a quantum computing route. And for those people, that is an easier transition into taking those coding skills. You know, there are ways to access simulators with common ML techniques like Python or, or other um, scripting languages. And that gives people an ability to um, start to educate themselves, start to transition that team into learning what may or may not work, and focus on areas where there could be benefits. Um, and as the hardware catches up, that means for those organizations, they're in a much better position to take advantage of it, even if they haven't had the immediate need to invest up front. Okay, and uh, Mohammed, can you please describe the use cases that Saudi Aramco is trialing for quantum mm -hmm. computing currently? Yeah, in fact, we, we try to uh, explore the, the different areas. Since we, we talk about a large company, large corporation, uh, from upstream to downstream, so we, we check all those uh, possibilities that would, would provide, the quantum would provide advantage of. But the, uh, of course, for when we talk about optimization, simulation, and, and machine learning, these are the, the areas. Uh, <clears throat> security is, is one that we, we are addressing right now. Uh, additionally, of course, like uh, any uh, energy and oil and gas company, they, we care about the uh, carbon emissions and circular economy. That's, that's one of the important topics, yeah. Okay, great. And Stuart, how should adopters think about uh, the different quantum computing hardware options and what might be best for their specific needs and goals? How, how should they try to future-proof mm -hmm. their operations? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a great question. I'm sure many people in this room, I, I, I'd be amazed if anyone in this room could hand on heart um, say they know which quantum computing hardware technology is going to be uh, the best. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, you know, at the moment, the most developed, I suppose, are, um, are superconducting technologies, which IBM and Google and so forth have worked, but they are very noisy, even if they scale, and there are engineering challenges uh, in that scaling. Ion traps are perhaps less noisy, but s reaching scale at that is currently far from proven. Um, and you know, even more emergent technologies. I noted in, in this country, the Ministry of Defense just uh, signed an agreement uh, with, um, with Orca for their um, photonic technologies, uh, which are coming out as well. No one knows exactly which of those will work, in my view, and what their uses might be. Um, uh, it's funny, I've, I've seen a lot of people describe it as, is this equivalent to the VHS versus Betamax challenge? Uh, and it, it's, I can't remember, I think a journalist described it's more fundamental than that. It's more like, uh, should you use valves or switches if you were designing a computer in the 1930s? Or um, an analogy I've used before, it's more like the Wright brothers trying to decide, should they use rotor blades or wings for the first <laughs> aircraft? And in the same way, if we take that analogy, that a helicopter has different uses and an aircraft has different, you know, a plane has different uses, I suspect, at least in the near term, that's what the hardware is going to look like. We may well find a scaled version of ion traps, maybe using a broader electric field, um, could be used for smaller scale computation where noise is the enemy, but scale isn't of great benefit. By contrast, superconducting, um, which I think is where most of the money has been put and where most people are investing at the moment. Um, certainly for big full-scale opportunities, I think is likely to be um, the right ones. And then, of course, we all have uh, the annealing technologies, which um, uh, you know, we were just hearing about it is much more commercialized. So um, uh, if I could just take one second more, actually, on the other part mm -hmm. of your question, which is how do you future-proof against it? Again, I think for most organizations that I've spoken with, they're future-proofing by not committing. <laughs> they're practicing in simulation, they're practicing in 
um, investigating where a good opportunity for quantum QT might sit in their core business. And I think that is the right for the majority of organizations, but I slightly fear it does mean people are spreading their bets. And I, part of me wonders that for those companies where the advantage of quantum computing is so large um, to justify more specific investment, and the nature of the problem they want to solve can guide them more to a less noisy solution or a higher scaling solution. I think for those organizations, that is a minority of them, but um, you know, some are represented here, um, greater commitment to hardware is probably worthwhile uh, in order to accelerate that development because the, the hardware developers themselves are not going to solve your business problem. That's not, that's not what they're worried about. And the ability to cooperate and partner on specific technological issues where you think that technology is most likely to give advantage, I think for those organizations where the advantage is big enough and the pocket's deep enough, a higher degree of specificity might be to their benefit. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Mohammed, could you please describe the process Saudi Aramco used to decide when to start its uh, journey with quantum and to set up an R&D program? And how are you measuring success? Yeah, if I could just add to... Absolutely. Yeah, so our comment. Yeah, in fact, uh, through it's, right now there is no winning of the hardware itself. So we don't know in future who will win. Is it, will it be a superconducting, ion tribe, photonic, uh, topological, or, or others? Uh, and it's very important, and that's why like the, the cloud uh, access is important. Uh, there are some platforms that, that is hardware agnostic. And I think this, this is a very good tool that uh, we, we utilize to, depending on, on your use case, on the benefit, which hardware we, you will use, depending on the case. You don't have to go with all of them. That, uh, I believe, platform would give you the freedom to, to choose depending on, on the use case. Some, some cases, maybe annealing would be, D-Wave would, would be the best tool to, to do it. Some others would be the IBM superconducting, some other Honeywell uh, ion trapped would, would be the best. So true, until now, yeah. And, and you don't want to uh, maybe, uh, uh, you, you cannot have, have a winner. There is, in the market, no dominant hardware. Yeah, th this is just my comment. Mm. Uh, and, and from uh, uh, Saudi Aramco, I, I believe uh, it's very important for us to, uh, to understand that uh, maybe uh, situation. And of course, we, we work closely with the consulting companies. We get the latest reports. We see how, how the, the market is, is mo moving. Uh, additionally, we, we have partnership with with some of those companies in order for us to, to excel in the area because it's, it's very important for us, for us to, to get the competitive advantage at, at this stage. That, that's very important. Thank you very much. Okay. And, and how are you measuring success in your experiments and work? Yes, that's, that's uh, really a tricky question because uh, true. We, we have a very clear, um, uh, I would say, measurement and it, it's hard because we do have uh, one of the, uh, I would say, strongest HPC in the world. Uh, and lots of, of these uh, optimization problems or computational problems could be done through the HPC. Uh, the uh, measurement would be differently if this, whatever you, you are um, doing in quantum, would have some advantage over the classical approach. Otherwise, there is no need to, to have the quantum in first place. But we found out that in, in some areas, for example, the, the simulation, which simulating the molecules itself, HPC can't do it because of the nature of the, the quantum itself. And this is, I think, is, is a very good area to step into. Uh, and, but, but the normal measurement is, is this. At this stage, we can't have a 100% clear cut on that one, uh, but we are moving toward the, the, uh, the real advantage of it. Thank you. Great. Uh, Stuart, what types of quantum computing vendors do your clients tend to use? Are there particular vendors that are commonly used? Do your clients tend to focus on one vendor, or do they tend to rather more work with several vendors? Yeah, I, I think for 99% of people we speak with, um, 
they are, to the extent they're using a quantum computer directly at all, rather than a simulator, are renting it and traditionally renting it from IBM or, or D-Wave uh, to use those opportunities. Um, I think the other aspects in terms of vendors, I, my perception is there's a matching problem at the moment, if I could put it that way. Mm. The, the number of startups in the space and the distribution of expertise is growing every day. But it's not easy for organizations to find that or know who they're looking for. And likewise, I'm not sure the startups quite know which problems they are solving. So if I'm honest, most vendor relationships I'm observing are kind of happening a bit by accident. Hmm. Um, I think there's often a case that someone wants to find something and they managed to connect maybe at an event like this. Maybe someone proactively reached out and it happened to work. But I, I do think there's a, a matching problem, a translation issue in the industry at the moment of trying to get uh, vendors, particularly small vendors, which is a lot of, um, a lot of the ecosystem at the mm -hmm. moment, to have access to, um, to the companies that could use it and vice versa. That's a really interesting point. Um, Mohammed, kind of the, the same question, but from a practitioner standpoint, uh, what types of, of vendors is Saudi Ramco working with, and uh, what are the characteristics that are important to you uh, concerning your vendors? True. Yes. Uh, in fact, for us, we, we, we've done a massive research uh, to see the, the market in, in terms of uh, technical, in terms of uh, market trend, and, and all, all these uh, even investment to see wh where where the market stands and what's the foresight of it, and we believe that uh, yeah the the best thing is is to to have some partnership with uh, we call it end to end provider or the the major providers because they they have the uh, hardware they have uh, the systems the the software they have algorithms plus they have consultants uh, that we could we could have a complete program with them to, uh, to excel in the, in the quantum. Lots of startups are maybe, uh, they don't have this leverage. Mm -hmm. And they, they start with, with building up their cases and their, their I would say, ecosystem. But for, for large uh, corporations, yes, they have the complete ecosystem and this was our target. Um, and I believe we, we succeeded in that, yeah. Thank okay, you. so having a very integrated offer is, is a key aspect. I here. believe so, I believe okay. that is the, Okay. And uh, Mohammed, I'll stay with you for a second. Where does quantum computing fit within Saudi Aramco's overall technology management organization? Yes. That's the, the innovation strategy is, the, uh, is, is the, the right place over there because we, it's uh, an emerging technology, but very promising. It has lots of innovation in that regard. So I would say uh, it fits over there. And we closely, with, with the top management, we are monitoring it, and, and we have a good program to, to achieve it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, Stuart, it, shifting gears a little bit, what typically works well for clients in educating themselves about quantum computing and building specific technical skills for their staff? Yeah, and, and if I could extend that question, if I may. Yeah. There is a question beyond the technical skills, how you embed um, you know, relatively expensive R&D projects in, <laughs> in an organization, particularly when the technology isn't the easiest to explain. Um, and I think for that reason, there are two parts of the education, as I say. One is the technical side, which, as I say, most um, experience we've encountered is largely trying to transition existing business intelligence or machine learning teams, a portion of those people start to get to grips with quantum computing, maybe um, supported by some external hires who have maybe come from an academic background uh, as practitioners. And that approach seems quite sensible, at least to us at the moment, in terms of building up that technical capability. If you're not actually needing to build a quantum computer, then you don't need a, a giant team of physicists to um, maintain it. But the bit I think we're seeing the biggest challenge on is when organizations can set that up and there's a bit of a roadmap to do it, then you have the problem that you're incubating a highly technical, 
R&D project with a uncertain and quite long-term payback period that needs to be explained to you know, senior executives and decision makers as to why they're doing that. And that is the place where, and almost that ex executive education almost, mm. I think is where it's easy to um, fall down because if, mm. it, you know, if your technical team are busy trying to explain what you're doing in terms of collapse of the wave function, then it is very unlikely your um, investment committee is going to be particularly thrilled <laughs> at the um, opportunity to put more money after it. Um, so yeah, I, I would say there is a responsibility there, whether that can be done internally or whether that requires um, external practitioners or communication specialists to help translate that gap. But I don't think organizations should underinvest in bridging that divide. Otherwise, you know, you can quite easily have a siloed, potentially technically very successful, but in terms of the impact it has on the organization, it never gets anywhere. That's a very key point about executive education. Um, Mohammed, in, in your experience, uh, you know, how did Saudi Aramco approach that idea of executive ed education? Do you have any uh, suggestions for how adopt organizations could could be successful in that aspect of it? Uh, true, and and this, by the way, this goes along the same way with most of the emerging technologies. Mm -hmm. So if you have some some technology that is new and many people don't understand it, you would face some difficulties in, in getting executives agreement and understanding of it. So yeah, you, you would pay more attention to it. You you would, I think, uh, yeah, have more awareness sessions. Uh, and I, I see uh, one approach is very, I think, uh, good in that one is, is really t to show some cases. Proof of concepts would be, yes. Uh, this would, would make it very, uh, maybe, uh, clear to the executives that this is the case, this is what we would like to reach, and this would, would take us. And uh, you need to be clear on that one, that this is not, uh, similar to the other uh, areas. I'm, I'm from the uh, technology strategies, so this is our job. We, we see the new technologies and we, we try to adopt those ones. Uh, and most of times the technology is clear. Uh, it's very understood. So the, the case is, is very clear. Uh, the ROI is, is clear. Return of investment is clear. So it, 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 it goes through the approval uh, process easily. But sometimes quantum is one of them, is that you don't have very clear uh, uh, outputs in, ter in terms of uh, measuring the, the results. Uh, you don't have many, I would say, commercialized uh, products. Uh, you, it's not plug and play. You cannot just adopt those, those ones. You would need some R&D. You would need some proof of concepts in order to, uh, to, to sell that, that one. And in order for you to, to be even uh, sure that this technology will, will move forward with this use case. Okay. okay. Mohammed, you were talking earlier about uh, advantage. Um, does Saudi Aramco have uh, a hard date in mind of when you might expect to see that kind of advantage based on what you're doing with so far? Uh, it's hard to, to have a hard date on that one, especially on those, those um, technologies. Um, um, but I would say that we, we have like a clear program uh, with, with clear milestones. Uh, and and I, I would say at this stage, start yeah, the proof of concept, if it's clear, then you expand it, you move to the, to the next level until, until you reach the, the quantum advantage. This would be the key. Uh, mm -hmm. And it will be treated case by case. It's not uh, the, the whole quantum cases will be done at once and you push them to production, then you upscale scale them. It's, it's not the, the case. It would be a case by case. Uh, some cases would, would, uh, would be very success, successful. Some others, no, you, you would need to maybe change the, uh, the quantum hardware in that mm -hmm. regard or change something, the algorithms in that case. Uh, in order to reach the maybe the, the, the best direction. And it, it's taking some time. You can't have a very hard date on that one. Okay. Um, does Aramco have a process in mind for how eventually to scale up 
a quantum computing deployment into uh, full operational status, to move to that last stage, in other words? Yeah, of course, uh, every uh, technology, when, when we build it, when we introduce it, uh, the objective is to have the, the end result of it is to be uh, fully operationalized in the company, then uh, potential uh, investment, potential uh, commercialization could be, because we, we also commercialize some of our products over there. One. So definitely when we, when we have a use case, we need to be clear on, on what's the end result of it. Is it just a proof of concept? Is it R&D? Uh, is it operationalized in, in within the company? Or this is something that we can commercialize it? Yes. Okay. Thank you. We have uh, a little over 11 minutes left. I want to take a pause and just check if there's questions from the audience that we can address. We have a microphone available. And, and if you could please identify yourself and your organization, that would be great. Hi, I'm Berenice Baker um, with Enter Quantum. Um, I was wondering how are, how are you planning to measure success with your quantum experiments? To whom is it addressed? Star? I, I, I'd give it to you to some extent. So I, <laughs> I, yeah. I advise people thinking on how to measure success more than I measure it myself. Uh, true. <laughs> yeah, the, as I mentioned earlier, it's, it's very hard at this stage to, to measure the success similar to the normal way that we, we do. A return of investment, and uh, but if the uh, the use case, if the, the quantum uh, will provide some uh, measurable measurable results that would uh, exceed the classical approach, that would be one. Uh, if it would be better in, in security, it would secure uh, the the system better. This would be another one. So you talk about performance, you talk about security, uh, and you talk about cost if this could be achieved uh, through uh, less cost or less energy consumption, this would be uh, another factor for it. Yes. Thank you. If you would like to add. Uh, Hi. Uh, yeah, Peter Rogers of Tato. Um, I advise companies on quantum adoption, and there's a lot of discussion about advantage, and obviously that's the exciting part of quantum. But if you look at it from a SWOT, kind of analysis, there's, yeah. there's four things you've got to think about. And the advantage is obviously the, the gold at the end of the rainbow. But today we're anticipating the gold. That's maybe three, five, ten years away. But there's immediately the, the millennium bug type of problem of there's a threat, which is in ten years all our data could be in the clear if quantum happens. So we need to be thinking about our architectures fundamentally from what happens in a quantum world. We need to be anticipating that now. And I think that if you think about the SWOT, um, you've got the threat, which is, you know, suddenly everything is in the clear. The weakness is talent is in very, very scarce supply. So I need to, how do I anticipate that gap of talent? How do I deal with that? How do I get to the advantage? And I think the strength ultimately all enterprises are looking for is like quantum coherence. How do we integrate quantum into our systems in a coherent way that complements our existing systems? So I guess the question for you guys is we've heard about advantage, but what about threat? What about weaknesses? In, and, and how do we get to a coherent state in the end game? Um, I'm happy to take a stab at that. No, I think I wholeheartedly agree, particularly on the weakness side, that um, there is a lack of availability of talent. And I think there is, to some extent, these things do can grow exponentially as emerging successes arise. And I think that does put a weight, a burden of proof on people. I can imagine um, having these same conversations in five years' time will be feeling somewhat depressing, um, even if the technology has advanced. And that can cause ebbs and flows in the investment cycle, which not only um, will you know, starve people of capital, but it also starve them of talent. On the threat side, I mean, I think you're right to highlight uh, cryptography as a, as a clear example when it gets there. And 
it feels to me an example of what I sometimes call a who pays problem, which is everyone knows there's an issue or a benefit. Everyone knows they ought to invest, but nobody wants to be the person that invests first because um, if you crack it, you benefit everyone, but you can't necessarily uh, monetize that all for yourselves. And I think in those situations, realistically, that requires um, you know, public sector cooperation internationally to help um, lubricate the, um, the uh, you know, organization's approach to it. But I, at the moment, I, if I'm being candid, I think we're underfunded on that thread. Mohammed, did you want to add? Or yeah, I second you on that one. The uh, talent is, is very rare, and it's, it's a very uh, challenging. Cybersecurity is, cryptography is, is a very important topic, and I think now NIST is, is finalizing the, uh, uh, I think the qualified uh, organization, qualified codes for that one, and we will be uh, adopting that one. So, yeah. Hi, um, it's Haik Karamijan from DHL. So I guess I'm, I'm wondering, is there any solid examples where you can point to and say, you know, uh, this technology has had a benefit here? And it, maybe the answer is no, because there's no um, quantum advantage proven as yet. Um, but then if you wanted to sort of get the interest, is it? Maybe to highlight there's potential threats coming. What 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 would be the sort of solid you know the sort of elevator speech you would give to a a, a company that might be considering moving in you know looking into this technology? Uh, well, I think for a, for a logistics provider, I'd probably say you know you will know better than I, but I would take a punt at for every second you can save on delivery, that's worth a few million pounds in your, um, in your profitability. Quantum algorithms give a promise of uh, maybe not an exponential speed up, but certainly a you know, quadratic speed up or similar to logistic, um, uh, you know, logistical um, optimization problems. And as a result, the benefit that organizations like DHL could uh, receive from this is gargantuan. Um, even if it's a few years away, and DHL would not wish to be left behind by um, anyone who has managed to invest maybe at relatively moderate cost up front to be able to address that. In the near term, I think areas like annealing do give a gateway for that kind of optimization style planning, and I know um, it's a shame um, uh, Safraz, the uh, other panelist, wasn't able to make it at Johnson & Johnson, but I remember in our pre-meeting, he was discussing how uh, one of the areas they were most interested in was logistics for vaccine rollout, um, because they recognized that their ability to do that in a more cost-effective way is, um, is hugely beneficial. So, I, yeah, my pitch would be, don't, um, don't get left behind by that, because the prize is large enough and the technology is mature enough to start learning now rather than just um, hoping for its anticipation in the future. Yes. Uh, are you from DHL? Yes. yes. I believe uh, there, there was a use case for DHL or for, for logistics. Uh, I believe either with uh, maybe uh, Honeywell or there to resolve in, in logistics, I believe in, in uh, the, the box sizing or something. The, the knapsack uh, problem, uh, if you are, they, they uh, showed that use case that using the quantum, uh, I would say, I think Kopu was, mm. or yeah, they used it to, uh, to find the, the right combination of, of the size for, for certain boxes, what's, what's the best, uh, uh, I think, size, what, what's the best capacity that you could, you could do. They call it, uh, knapsack yeah, problem. The, the most efficient way to pack. Uh, exactly, space. exactly yeah. that one. Yes, I don't know if this one uh, went through because that one, that time they they mentioned they showed us that use case that it succeeded in, in uh, getting the the optimal uh, solution for that one. So we were expecting that uh, this would grow up and we would have some maybe uh, some commercial solution or some something. If if you don't have if you have any information on that one. 
Good, thank you. Because, yeah, in fact, for the use cases, we, we are updated with all the use cases. We, we don't have many uh, quantum computing use cases. That's why maybe every use case is very clear on, on that one. <laughs> and yes, we, we are really uh, trying to, to see some commercialized uh, implementation on that one. Okay, okay. thank you. I think we have time for one, maybe two more questions. Hi, um, Faisal Kamran from Sony. I wholeheartedly um, agree with the gentleman over there in the front. My apologies, I've missed your name again. Um, there's a lot of funding, as was talked about earlier today, from the State, of, um, State Secretary too, which is available on the quantum computing. And you talked about this point of being underfunded. Um, there are a lot of problems which are not being addressed, while there's a lot of investment into the new technologies and the opportunities. Just looking at the technological fronts, you go from superconducting computing to quantum um, uh, diamond vacancies, neural um, networks, you talk about silicon-based um, uh, quantum computings, atom-based, and this plethora of these new technologies which are coming out without having proof of concept, it uh, demands a lot of resources. If you just keep up coming with the new ideas only, without having investments into proofing something which already exists or not, how do you consolidate these, uh, these, these fundings into more sustainable routes to have a much more effective future technology then? Gosh, um, yes, I wish um, there was an easy answer to, <laughs> to that. I think the proliferation of technology is in some ways an inevitable period in any R&D-like situation. The, strange thing here is that R&D is being done at a global scale by um, a number of organizations. I think, I think my view from where we are maturity-wise is that is right, but over time, technologies will start to prove differentiation between themselves, and that will help stop the kind of Ponzi scheme of ambition that I fear we can create, whereby the more immature your technology is, your ability to promise more goes up. Um, you know, I, I'm hopeful that as real examples appear, that is where the money will actually flow because people will have use cases for that and that will differentiate. But I wholeheartedly agree with your point. At the moment, the options are far sure. wider than I think the final um, outcomes will be, at least personally. Well, we've come to the end of our scheduled time. I guess I would uh, ask if, uh, Mohammed and Stuart, if you want to provide your final last piece of most important advice to potential adopters, if you want to take a few minutes for that. Okay. Uh, I can, I can. Okay, thank you. Uh, I would say uh, uh, focus on your potential use cases. Try to find one or two. Uh, start with... Uh, some uh, experiment the, the, the system itself through some uh, cloud services. Uh, very important to, to have a partner, uh, consulting company that would help you uh, on that journey. Upskill your people, this, this would be uh, a major item to, to consider too. Thank you. Um, I, th I think my answer would be first and foremost, think very carefully do you need to invest in quantum computing now? If you can afford to wait because your business activities allow it, then, um, you know, to the gentleman from Sony's point, there's a lot of ways to lose money in this currently, and you don't need to take that risk if the benefit to you isn't so much. If it does need to be now, and there are a number of organizations for which that is true, then I would back up everything Mohammed just said, that um, think about the problem, think about the people you need, um, and think about setting your organization up, whether that's executive education or similarly, so that it can be not just a technical success, but, an, but a business-wide one. Wonderful. Well, please join me in thanking Stuart and Mohammed. Thank you.